Did you know the library is full of dirt? Join us this summer as we get the dirt, discovering interesting reading trails. There have been trails about rabbits, fireflies, monster trucks, and more. Today's Get the Dirt is about mandolins and violins. Why an episode about mandolins and violins together? Let's get the dirt. I brought with me today a violin and two mandolins. Do you know which is which? Let's get the dirt. Here are some clues. There are two types of mandolins. One is an A-style mandolin. The other has quite a few names. Bullback, roundback, potato bug, beetleback, and more. Can you guess which ones are the mandolins? Yes, the A-style mandolin has F-holes for sound holes and is pear-shaped. The bullback mandolin, on the other hand, is almond shaped at, with a rounded, rounded back, see how round that is, and a round sound hole. And you probably recognize the violin from our episode on violin versus fiddle. Here's a song, it's called Dan O'Keefe's Slide on violin. sounds like when plucked on a mandolin. I'm going to pluck it on my A style mandolin because this is the one I'm more used to plucking. that those sound quite different. But they're also the same. Let's get the dirt on the parts of the mandolin and violin to see how they're the same. Do you notice something missing on the violin that the mandolin has? Yes, the violin does not have frets. These metal things right there. That means that the violinist has to memorize positioning through muscle memory and practice to correctly place their fingers. Many beginning violinists use tape on their violin fingerboard, like I have here, to mark finger spaces. Professionals don't normally use tape. Their many years of practice has led to building their muscle memory to perfection. Did you know that mandolins and violins have the same fingering? That means that you place your fingers in the same positions on the fingerboards for both mandolin and violin. Let's get the dirt. Here's a G major scale on mandolin. Watch where my fingers go. Remember how that sounds? Now, here's a G major scale on violin. They sound pretty close, don't they? Yes, mandolins and violins are very versatile instruments in the styles of music that they play. However, most people associate mandolins with folk and bluegrass music, which complements the fiddle style of music on violin very well. You can pluck both a mandolin and a violin, but you can only bow a violin. You cannot bow a mandolin. Many mandolin players use strumming and chords, as you would on a guitar. The mandolin has eight strings, two for each of the notes, G, D, A, E. The 
violin has four strings, one for each of the notes, G, D, A, E. Same strings. But on mandolin, it is G, G, D, D, A, A, E, E. And on violin, it's just G, D, A, E. Only one of each. Get the dirt on this. There's a violin that has double strings. Do you know what it's called? The Hardinger violin from Norway has two of each of its strings. It is a very ornate instrument and sounds amazing. Here's a demonstration of a familiar folk hymn, All Fly Away. First, I'll pluck it on the mandolin. Here, I'll fly away, bowed. strumming along with the violin. many famous violin players. One of these is Vanessa May Vanacord Nicholson. Her mother was from China and her father was from Thailand. Vanessa May became a professional musician when she was only 11 years old. A book about musicians that features Vanessa May is called Musicians by Leslie Strudwick. You can get the dirt on musicians in the 780 section at your local library. The first book we're going to read is called The Bear, the Dog, and the Fiddle. It is written and illustrated by David Litchfield. Now, does this look like a fiction or a non-fiction book to you? Yes, this is a fictional book, and you can tell because in, this, in the library where this was cataloged, it has an F for fiction and an L for Litchfield. And Hugo were best friends. Hector was a fiddle player and Hugo was one of his biggest fans. Over the years they'd had the good times, bad times, and even some crazy times. But now times weren't so great. What are we gonna do Hugo? Hector said as they walked home. My act is yesterday's news. Who'd want to listen to an old fiddler like me when they can watch a world-famous piano-playing bear? 
Who go wolf to say that he would? But Hector just sighed. I'm too old for this game, boy, he said. I guess I'll never get to play in a big concert hall like I dreamed. And with that, Hector packed away his fiddle forever. Now that Hector didn't go out to play music, he spent most of his time watching TV, listening to audiobooks, sleeping, sleeping, and sleeping some more. Hector in Hugo's neighborhood was noisy, so Hector kept the window shut when he slept. But well, one night, he forgot. In the early hours of the morning, a strange noise woke him up. Hector crept out of bed, tiptoed down the hallway, and pushed open the door to the roof. Hugo was playing Hector's fiddle, and the music Hugo was playing was toe-tappingly, finger-clickingly, whistle-blowingly awesome. Hector's tummy hurt a bit when he saw everyone in the neighborhood nodding along. Then, but then he saw something else how much his friend loved to play. The next morning, Hector taught Hugo all the tricks of the trade he'd learned over the years. Before long, a crowd had gathered. News of the incredible fiddle-playing dog spread, and one day, a very famous bear came to watch. Bear told Hugo that he was starting a band of musical animals. He invited him to come on a tour and play his fiddle for hundreds of thousands of people. As Hugo looked up at Hector, his tail wagging, Hector's tummy started to hurt again. He was jealous. I guess you should go, he said, trying to smile. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. Hugo's tail wagged even more as he packed to go away with Bear's big band, making sure the fiddle was safely stowed. But Hector began to have second thoughts. Don't go and join that silly group, Hugo, he said. We don't need them. Hugo put his head on Hector's knee, but Hector pushed him away. Fine, said Hector, I'm sure you'll be back with your tail between your legs. You're not even that good. Hugo picked up his suitcase and left. Suddenly, Hector felt awful. Wait, Hugo, he cried, I'm sorry. But it was too late. With Bear's big band, Hugo toured the world, playing spectacular shows to sold out crowds of adoring fans. Hugo was the star of the show, with Bear on the piano, Big G on drums, and Clint the Wolfman Jones grooving on the double bass. Millions of people watch them all over the world on their televisions and computer screens. Millions of people, including Hector. As he watched, he missed making music. He missed playing his fiddle. But most of all, he missed his friend. One day, Hector saw some posters announcing that Bear's band was playing at the big concert hall in his city. Hector wanted to go, but then he remembered the horrible thing he had said. What if Hugo didn't want him there? Hector bought a ticket anyways and found a spot up front, right by the stage. He noticed that Hugo had a new fiddle and wondered what had happened to his old one. But then the band started playing. Hector couldn't believe how mind-blowingly, toe-tappingly, finger-clickingly awesome the music was. Hugo, he shouted, it's me, Hector. You're brilliant. I'm so proud of you. But Hugo just whispered something to Bear, who whispered something to a security guard. Then they continued to play. A few minutes later, he Hector felt two big paws grab him. What's going on? He asked nervously. The security guards picked up Hector and took him into a dark corridor. It's okay, Hector said. I was going to leave anyway. Let me go. But the guards just kept walking with Hector, squished between them, till suddenly they stopped. And Hector realized where he was. Ladies and gentlemen, boomed a voice, I am pleased to announce that tonight, Bear's Big Band will be joined by a very special guest. Please give a warm welcome to Hector. I'm told that our star Hugo wouldn't be here without him. As the crowd cheered, Hugo passed Hector, his old fiddle. He kept it safe all this time. He wolfed and wagged his tail. And as Hector took his fiddle, he realized that though he and Hugo might have some good times, some bad times, and even some times apart, he would still always be friends. Because good friendships, just like good music, lasts a lifetime.
The next book we're going to read is a fictional book called Mole Music, and it was written and illustrated by David McPhail. Mole lived all alone underground. He spent his days digging tunnels. At night, he ate his supper in front of the TV and then went to bed. But Mole liked his life, but he felt that something was missing. One night, that on the television, a man played the violin. He made the most beautiful music Mole had ever heard. I want to make beautiful music too, Mole said to himself. So the next day, he sent away for a violin of his own. Every day, Mole checked his mailbox. No violin. Finally, after three weeks, it arrived. Mole was so excited. He picked up the violin and drew the bow across the strings. But instead of beautiful music, all he made was a horrible screeching sound. Mole we'll tried again. The violin still screeched, but not quite so horribly. Mole kept at it. After about a week, he could play one note, then two, and before a month went by, he could play an entire scale. Mole continued to practice. He learned to put the notes together in a simple song. Years went by. Mole got better and better. He was happier than he'd ever been. During the days he dug tunnels, Mole hummed the music he would play at night. Now Mole played even better than the man he'd seen on TV so long ago. Sometimes he wondered what it would be like to play his music for people. He imagined himself playing for a huge audience. He imagined that he played for presidents and queens. He even imagined that his music could reach into people's hearts and melt away their anger and sadness. Why, maybe his music could even change the world. Mole laughed at himself. How silly I am, he thought, imagining that my music could do all that when no one has ever even heard it. Mole played one more song, then put down his violin and went to sleep and dreamed beautiful, peaceful dreams. Do you, did you hear the music playing in the background while I read mole music? That was Itzhak Perlin. His parents moved from Poland to Israel in the prelude to World War II. Itzhak Perlman contracted polio at age four and has walked using leg braces and crutches since. He plays the violin while seated. Perlman first became interested in the violin after hearing a classical music performance on the radio. At the age of three, he was denied admission to the Shulamit Conservatory for being too small to hold a violin. He instead taught himself how to play the instrument using a toy fiddle until he was old enough to study at the conservatory. He gave his first recital at age 10. He moved to the United States at age 13 to study at the Juilliard School. Next, we're going to read a book about a violinist from Paraguay. It is nonfiction and it is called Ada's Violin. It is a biography of Ada Rios. A biography is a book that tells about someone's life. The author of Ada's Violin is Susan Hood, and the illustrator is Sally Wern Comport. Ada Rios grew up in a town made of trash. Every morning at dawn, Ada heard the first garbage trucks rumble and roll down the road to Keturah. Beep, 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 backing into the landfill, they tipped their loads up and up and crash. The trash came tumbling down, 1,500 tons each day. Ada and her friends watched as the ganachrios, recyclers, scrambled, tearing into plastic bags with long-handled hooks, pushing aside moldy produce and grabbing anything they could recycle or sell. The going rates? 
5 cents for a pound of cardboard, 10 cents for a pound of plastic. The noisy, stinking, sweltering slum was not the most nurturing neighborhood. Ada watched, eyes wide, but she didn't say much. And yet she liked to imagine each garbage truck was a box of surprises. One never knew what, what might be inside. Her father had found appliances, toys, perfumes, and antique watches. One woman even discovered a small box full of gold jewelry. Little did Ada know, there's a bigger surprise waiting for her inside the landfill. Every day when Ada's parents went to work, Grandmother Miriam cared for Ada and her little sister, Noelia. Grandma loved to sing rock and roll sounds from the 1960s. The girls grew up to the tunes of the Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, and Credence Clearwater Revival. Ada loved to sing too, but only when nobody was listening. Ada's dad brightened the night with stories and songs of great musicians. He turned up the radio and pointed out the sounds each instrument made. Ada heard one above all others. Zing went the strings of the violin. When the girls started school, Grandma returned to work as a recycler, collecting bottles and cans in the city. Classes let out at noon. Young Ada was in charge of Noelia until her parents were done with work. At first, the girls stayed close to home, playing with Grandma Miriam's doggies and making sandcastles in the dirt. Soon they joined their cousins, playing hide and seek or a game of handball in the streets. In time, they ventured farther afield, walking down to the pagoda to get candy. But Ada noticed the teenagers hanging out in the alleys, grumbling about life in the landfill looming ahead. What happened to them? To her? To her little sister? She watched as the other older kids turned to gangs and got in fights. One day, when Ada was 11 years old, her grandmother saw a sign posted on the wall of a chapel. Violin, guitar, cello taught Saturdays at 8 a.m. Fabio Chavez. How grandma had longed to learn music. Too late for her, maybe, but not for her granddaughters. She signed them out without asking them or their parents. Ada's heart sang out. Thanks to her abuela, she could leave her worries behind and learn to play. At the first class, the teacher, Fabio Chavez, had three guitars and two violins to share. Ada chose a violin right away. But 10 children had signed up. Frustrated, Ada and her friends found out that there were not enough instruments to go around. And there was a bigger problem. Everyone quickly realized that the children would need to practice at home. But it wasn't safe to be seen with an expensive instrument in Katora, where a violin is worth more than a house. Watching the children play amid broken glass and rusty metal, Senor Chavez knew he had to do something. He remembered a band called Les Luthiers that made its own instruments. That was it. He asked Nicolas Cola Gomez, a ganchero and carpenter, for help. Senor Gomez found a discarded drum with a big hole in it. What could he use to fix it? He picked through the trash and discovered an old x-ray film. Would that work? It did! Senor Gomez, Gomez kept experimenting and others, like Tito Romero, helped. Inventing instruments wasn't easy, but they fiddled around, discovering which materials hit just the right notes. They transformed oil drums into cellos, water pipes into flutes, and packing crates into guitars. Soon, there were enough instruments for all the children who wanted to play. Ada chose a violin made from an old paint can, an aluminum baking tray, a fork, and pieces of wooden crates. Worthless to thieves, it was invaluable to her. It was a violin of her very own. Senor Chavez set up a strict schedule of three-hour lessons. The class had no classrooms, so they played outside, despite the hundred-degree heat and sudden downpours. At first, Ada and the others struggled. Sharps and flats clanged and clashed. Playing an instrument is a process. It doesn't matter if one is rich or poor, ugly, fat, thin. You cannot learn to play an instrument overnight, Senor Chavez told the children. Some kids decided it was too much work and gave up, but not Ada. After a lesson, she would practice at home, 
sometimes two hours a day. In time, the screeches, twangs, and tweets hit all the right notes. The class became a small island where Chavez taught them to respect themselves and one another. Be kind, always say please and thank you. Say you're sorry, be dedicated when you commit to something, Senior Chavez told the children. Soon the ragtag crew of kids learned to tune in, to listen to one another, to band together. The recycled orchestra was born. From then on, there was something new in the air in Katora. Gonchiro's trugging home from the landfill might lift their heads to hear the sounds of Ada's violin, or the strains of Bibi's cello, or the strum of Noelia's guitar. A symphony of sound helped to lift them beyond the heat, the stench, and their aching backs. With her violin, Ada could close her eyes and imagine a different life. She could soar on the high, bright, bittersweet notes to a place far away. She could be who she was meant to be. As Ada's skill grew, so did her confidence. Once timid, she now took center stage, playing solos. She helped teach the younger children, too. Her teachers and fellow students took note. When she was 12 years old, Ada was named a first violinist. Imagine, she was first at something. Shortly after, she and her 39 fellow musicians were invited to perform concerts in Katora and later in the nearby capital of Asuncion. Word of this extraordinary orchestra spread. Soon they were asked to perform in other cities and even other countries. Ada and her friends flew on their first airplane, stayed in their first hotel, swam in the bright blue waters of the Rio de Janeiro, sampled their first pastries and pineapple, saw sights they never imagined. The world dazzled them, just as they dazzled the world. When Ada was 16, the orchestra received a very special invitation. They were asked to tour with a world-famous rock band. More than 35,000 people awaited them at their first concert stop in Bogota, Colombia. Ada was more than nervous. She didn't know how to enter or how to greet the audience. She went blank. She saw a giant stage with glaring lights and heard people screaming. But she didn't have to worry. As the recycled orchestra took the stage, the people who had paid to see the rock band cheered for them. The enormous audience sang and swayed to the music as the orchestra played. As the performance came to a close, a crescendo of cheers, chants, and applause resounded across the park. The astonished kids bowed, grinning at one another. They had discovered the surprise waiting in the landfill. Buried in the trash was music. And buried in themselves was something to be proud of. Do you think you could learn to play on a recycled violin like Ada Rios did? Last, we'll learn about the song and the music that we heard during while I was reading the book was the recycled orchestra playing. That was Ada playing her violin and her friends playing on their instruments. Last, we'll learn about the song, I Wonder As I Wonder. It is from Appalachia, where mandolin is very popular. In this account of the song, while John Jacob Niles was in Murphy, North Carolina, he heard an Appalachian girl singing. He recounts, a girl had stepped to the edge of the little platform attached to the automobile. She began to sing. Her clothes were unbelievably dirty and ragged, and she too was unwashed. Her ash blonde hair hung down in long skeins. But best of all, she was beautiful, and in her untutored way, she could sing. She smiled as she sang, smiled rather sadly, and sang only a single line of a song. Niles only remembered three lines from the song, and from that, created the Christmas song, I Wonder As I Wander. As I read the book, you'll hear me playing the song on mandolin.
you think? Is a violin or a mandolin in your future? There are many musicians around you just waiting to pass the music down. Be sure to tune in next week as we get the dirt on more music. Until then, be sure to get the dirt on this summer library reading program, Digging Deeper. There are great prizes awaiting eager readers.